Good afternoon. It's great to be with everyone. Happy Father's Day again to all the fathers. If you are a father, I just would like to encourage you before we begin the lesson. As we talked about last week, you really are on the front lines of the battle for the kingdom of God. From the family comes the cultural mandate. It's the fountain of fruitfulness for God's kingdom. And so just want to encourage you this afternoon to keep up the good fight, not to become discouraged, to remember the one who abides within you, the power that you have through the spirit and the wisdom. Be wise, act like men, and lead your families. Our text before the lesson is, comes from Genesis, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 13. Genesis 3, 1 through 13, these are God's words. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to to be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. Please be seated. At present, we are running two teaching series concurrently. A study on shame that we've entitled Make Stigma Great Again, and a theological survey of the opening chapters of Genesis that we are calling The Beginning. Today, these two studies intersect in the third chapter of Genesis, a stroke of homiletical genius, if I say so myself, although it happened absolutely by random or perhaps divine intervention. Basil of Caesarea, who was a fourth century church father, makes much of the fact that the first prohibition that man receives is an embargo on eating, that Adam is not permitted to partake of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. And this, according to the good bishop, establishes what he calls the law or the principle of fasting that fasting is an essential spiritual, and we might even say physical, discipline for man. And that's an insight that I'm in hearty agreement with. But what is also important, what's also important to point out, is that that divine injunction to fast from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil comes after a divine invitation to feast upon the earth. As we see in Genesis 1:29, God says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Or again in Genesis 2:16, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. And so the command to fast that we see in Genesis is preceded by the command to feast. 
And what God is actually offering Adam here, as theologian Peter Lightheart has pointed out, is not just food, but the whole of creation. Meaning that God is laying before his image bearer a world suffused with delights and riches for him to enjoy. A feast that will satisfy Adam's innate hunger as long as he partakes of it in communion with his creator, as long as he is seated at the Lord's table. And this context helps us to put the purpose of Adam's fasting and the practice in general in perspective. In scripture, feasting is given priority over fasting. We were made ultimately, in other words, to feast, not to fast. For as we said, Adam was commanded to eat, drink, and be merry first, not to abstain. And the same will be true for those who stand before the bounty of the new heavens and the new earth. I go back to Revelation 22, 17, which says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. In the divine meta-narrative, right, we see it at the beginning and at the end. The command to man is to come and feast. That will be the first command that we hear, just as Adam heard it first, in the new heavens and the new earth and the eschaton. And so in this divine meta narrative, while fasting is an essential part of the story, it, it's the bridge to feasting. It's not the whole story because it's only the bridge. It's not the destination. It's not the end, in other words, it's only a means to the end. And so therefore, I don't think that Adam's fast from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was meant to be permanent. Rather, I think that in time, God would have joyfully allowed his image bearer to partake of this fruit also. It's interesting in 1 Kings, Chapter 3, verse 9, which is the text I preached a sermon on fasting a while back, and we went to this text briefly. But in 1 Kings 3, this is the text where God praises Solomon concerning his requests for wisdom. God says, I'll give you whatever you want. He says, what I want is wisdom, you know, discernment, so I can judge among the people instead of riches or fame. And so God praises him for that, of course, because he receives the wisdom. Therefore, that will then lead to the worldly riches and fame. But in this a text, it speaks of the knowledge of good and evil. This phrase is used again here in 1 Kings 3, 9. And it refers to a discernment for administrating justice. And so this knowledge is a kind of royal insight. It's a judicial wisdom, as one writer puts it. In other words, it's the very kind of discernment required for one to serve as a vice regent over God's good creation. As we said last time, Adam's original vocation, right, is to be the ruler on earth as it was, as it were. And this fruit represents then the wisdom needed in order to exercise that dominion. A wisdom that is the result of maturity and thus can only come through experience. As we heard read to us from Hebrews 5.14, which again says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. As a newborn babe, naked and naive in the garden, Adam was not ready to partake of the rich fruit which would provide him this royal insight. He needed to start with milk so that in time he could digest the meat, which means that the only way for Adam to fully enjoy the benefits of the feast of the kingdom was for him to keep the fast, was for him to abstain from the fruit until he and it, presumably, was ready to be consumed. A pattern which applies not only to this particular tree, nor even to just food, but to everything that God was offering Adam. Again, I quote from Peter Lightheart, 
who writes this, if Adam was going to feast on the fruit of the other trees, he would have to dress and keep the garden. If he was going to mine the gold, the good gold, down in Havilah, which is spoken about in Genesis 2, 11 through 12, he would have to trudge down there or sail down the Pashan River and start digging. The feast, in other words, is the reward for those who complete the fast, for those who don't impatiently grab for the prize, but who are willing to do the work necessary in order to possess it in the proper manner, meaning that there is no shortcut to feasting because there's no shortcut to maturity. There's no fast pass to wisdom. Knowledge, unlike what people will say today, knowledge is not just a few swipes away. Truth, and this is especially true of divine truth, has to be wrestled to the ground before its blessing will be bestowed. There's no other way. You have to strive with and for Wisdom. It has to be earned the hard way through constant toil and practice, as it says in Hebrews. This is a law of nature that cannot be supplanted. And it, by the way, it's one of the reasons why, when it comes to the leaders of the church, the scripture refers to them as elders, which means these are men who have had time to learn through experience who have had their hip put out of socket more than a few times from wrestling with divine truth and with some of the sheep, to be honest. These are men who are mature, who are wise, who have earned that wisdom over time, who bear the marks of Christ on their body, we might say. And so it's those who are to lead are not those who are just the most gifted, right, or the most charismatic, or those who are the most successful in business, but it is to be men who have real wisdom. one One of the signs of which, of course, is that they manage their household well. And so if Adam was to partake of the full bounty of what his father was offering him, he would have to patiently labor for years, fasting until he and the fruit were ripe enough for him to eat. Now, Kristen Files and I have been working, um, maybe we'll do some, some crowdsourcing here, but we've been working on a tagline for the church on the square. Not a mission statement, we have that, right? The three R's, revive the church, reach the city, and renew the culture. But we're wanting to have a punchy slogan that sums up who we are and what we are about. And one of the things that we were discussing, especially based upon the recent lessons I've been giving, is something like you know, preparing Christians for kingship, right? ready, ready, readying Christians to rule. Today we might say preparing them to feast. Because while our vocation is renewed at our baptism, right? We we are reborn, but the point is is that we're reborn a babe in Christ. A prince who is in need of royal training in righteousness. And the church is to be our tutor. That's Ephesians 4. The church is here to get us ready to rule preparing Christians for their role as kings, as princes. Now, as we said in the last lesson, Adam's vocation as ruling priest is to exercise dominion over the earth, to extend the Edenic temple across the cosmos. A commission and a blessing, by the way, that Adam was to grow into. But of course, neither he nor Eve were willing to wait. Verse 6 of our text in Genesis 3 says, For they saw that the tree, I'm putting they, uh, but they saw that the tree was good for food and desirable to make one wise, and they took of its fruit and ate. And so in essence, Adam's sin was one of impatience. He wanted the entire feast of creation now. He wanted a shortcut to wisdom and blessing, which was exactly what the serpent offered him wisdom, honor, and glory on the cheap, which, by the way, is the exact same temptation that the devil uh, 
provides to the second Adam, to Jesus, when he's in the wilderness. It's a promise to become like God with a single bite, as long as you're willing to bow the knee. And it's a promise whose luster vanishes with the first taste. Now, you'll see the intersection here. One of the consequences of Adam's fall from grace is shame. In fact, the absence of shame is the primary characteristic that the writer of Genesis uses to describe God's newly formed world. In Genesis 2.25, which is the verse that comes right before our text in chapter 3, what we have is a transition statement between the creation narrative and the fall. And so it sort of summarizes the first two chapters, which are those of creation, when it says this, and the man and his wife were both naked and unashamed. What this means essentially is that in the garden, Adam and Eve existed in a state of perfect innocence. An innocence, an innocence that is symbolized by their unashamed nakedness. And really this innocence has at least two facets to it, it seems to me. The first two senses, the first sense of innocence is with regards to just naivete, meaning that Adam and Eve lack moral and social maturity, right? They are, in a sense, a babe. And so like the toddler who is blissfully unaware of his nakedness as he runs through the neighbor's sprinkler, there's something similar that's being pointed to here concerning Adam and Eve in the garden. But also, in terms of innocence, it has to do with the absence of sin and guilt. Adam and Eve were blameless in the eyes of God's law. And so this being unashamed, even though they are naked, is the result of both a lack of maturity, you might say, and a lack of sin. But all of that, of course, changes when we get to chapter 3. Because in chapter 3... As we read, Adam and Eve disobey God's prohibition uh, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They grasp for the knowledge in haste instead of receiving it through patient practice. And when they partake of it, verse 7 says this, and it was the promise of Satan, right? Their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. This is the moment that shame enters into the human experience with the opening of Adam and Eve's eyes. Now, if you remember our working definition of shame, it is that it's the feeling of disgrace that accompanies the awareness of falling short of some standard or ideal. It's a feeling of humiliation when one realizes that they've missed the mark. One of the primary Greek words that are, that's used in scripture for sin is hamartia, which in the Greek means essentially to miss the mark. The image is of a, of a uh, archer who shoots an arrow and doesn't even hit the target. So you can imagine the humiliation or shame that would come from missing the mark. In this case, of course, in Genesis 3, the mark they miss concerns God's law. And in response to that, response to of them falling short and then the humiliation that comes and the shame that follows. Adam and Eve, we are told in verse 7, quickly sow fig leaves together and make for themselves loincloths as a covering. And then when they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, instead of going out to meet him as they did before and to walk with him, they hide from his presence among the trees in the garden. That's verse 8. And then when God calls out to them, Adam responds in verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, obviously there are many important insights to draw from this infamous scene in Genesis 3. Let me just mention two uh, for time's sake. The first one to note is something that we've already mentioned, which is how prominent shame is in this narrative. It may only be mentioned once explicitly 
in chapter 2, verse 25, but the actions of Adam and Eve of hiding from one another and hiding from God put the idea of shame front and center. But secondly, it's important to consider the dramatic shift in meaning that takes place concerning the symbol of nakedness, where that which signified innocence in the first two chapters now, after the fall, functions as a marker of shame, a negative signification that continues throughout the rest of Scripture. If we move a little bit further in the Pentateuch, when we get to the time of the nation of Israel and the tabernacle, right, and moving on to the temple, when man now comes into God's presence, and he'll do so through the high priest, Nakedness now is viewed as an abomination. Like in Exodus 28, 42 through 43, this is speaking of the high priests, you shall make for them, the priests, linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips of the thighs and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after that. In fact, what we also find in the Old Testament is that the shame of nakedness is a sign of God's judgment. Like in Isaiah 23 through 4, where it says, And the Lord said, As my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Cush, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, both the young and the old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered, the nakedness of Egypt. Even when I mention those words, right, there's shame involved, in no matter what euphemism or language you use, right? So this is a punishment by God, this kind of public nakedness for adulterous nations. Or listen to Jeremiah 13, 26. I myself, God says, will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. And so after the fall, there's this dramatic shift of the metaphor of nakedness concerning shame. After the fall, it's no longer viewed in terms of innocence, but instead in terms of shame, in particular, the idea of public shame through public nakedness. And perhaps the ultimate example of this, of course, would be Jesus being crucified naked on the cross. The Roman cross was the perfect instrument of humiliation. It was one of the primary purposes of it. It's part of the torture of it is just to humiliate the person who is being crucified. So they had to carry the instrument of their death, this heavy cross, you know, up this hill naked, and then they would be crucified naked, and people could stand there and mock them, and they wouldn't even have enough breath in their lungs in order to say anything back. And so the idea of public shame through public nakedness, uh, sort of the ultimate uh, form of, of humiliation in the cross. And this is something, of course, we all know intuitively. We all understand and feel the connection between nakedness and shame. It's, it's a common fear of man that somehow he's going to be naked in public. I mean, I can imagine right now if all of a sudden, you know, I didn't have clothes on, it would be utterly humiliating uh, to myself, not only because I'm out of shape, but for, you know, it wouldn't matter. It's just we, we feel this connection immediately, the thought of it alone is enough to, get, to make you shudder. It's common to man, that connection. It's the thing of nightmares. Or think of it this way, sort of in the reverse. If you study, uh, you know, if you take a class on, on public speaking, one of the ways you're told, and it's sort of a cliche, but the, one of the ways that you fight, sta uh, fight against stage fright is by what? Picturing that you know, the, everybody in the audience is naked. In other words, you have to imagine the audience in a position of complete humiliation so that you will feel less threatened by them, which is not good advice for a Christian. I guess maybe you picture everybody in a clown outfit or something, something 
So you, you look ridiculous. The point being is that we have this shift where nakedness now itself becomes shameful, but where it also becomes the primary symbol or the primary metaphor for shame in general. And, and the reason why it's so effective, and it's tied to Genesis, it begins in Genesis, and so it's sort of the birth of shame happens there, so it's tied to the details of that story. But think about shame, right? Not just shame concerning one's nakedness, but shame in general. Shame produces in us this feeling of exposure, right? Of being laid bare. And so we instinctively want to cover ourselves in response to our own shame, to find a place to hide. In other words, we were, when we feel shame, we are reenacting what took place in the garden, regardless of what kind of shame it is. We want to cover ourselves, we want to hide, we want to disappear. And this is exactly what Adam and Eve do. And not only do they hide themselves from their father, but they hide themselves from one another by covering their nakedness with these fig leaves all of which represents a desire to escape the glare of judgment. Clothing, as one scholar noted, acts as a barrier to this judgment, right? It's sort of, you know, or judgment in general, we might say. Clothing can act like a barrier, can act as sort of a cover. Another example of this would be with a lecturer, right? A pastor or professor, generally, People who lecture, who speak publicly, prefer to have a lectern in front of them, a podium or a pulpit. And even one unlike this, or modern one, right, because you can see through it, is one that you can't see through. And the reason why is not because it's easier for their notes and, and for preaching, but because it protects them from their hearers, right? They're not as exposed. It's a covering. It, it provides a barrier. It's something that they can, at least in part, hide behind. Um, I will say this, when we were meeting in, at the Palace Theater, you know, it was this giant stage, it was up high, right? There was nothing on the stage, and I had a little music stand from which I was preaching. Early on, I felt completely exposed when I went up there. It was very uncomfortable for me, because it was just like, you're on stage and all these lights, and so it, there was this sense of being very exposed because I had very little to hide behind. So this idea of covering, right, is a way of trying to put up a barrier between you and that, that gaze of judgment, right, to, to try to hide yourself from it to some extent. Now, of course, if you're trying to hide yourself from God's judgment, God who is omnipresent, it's pure vanity. And when God finds Adam and asks him why he's hiding, the image bearer responds this way in verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. To which God replies, who told you you were naked? In verse 11. Which by the way, I take to be a rhetorical question. It's kind of like God is saying, so what if you're naked, right? Because Adam was unclothed in God's presence before, right? He didn't have any problem with it before. He felt no shame before. So why now, all of a sudden, is he afraid to be seen by God? Which means that Adam's real problem, of course, is not his nakedness, as he claims that it is, but it is his sin. And that's why God he doesn't even wait for a response. He goes right into, wait a minute, did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to? The issue is that Adam is now estranged from God. He, his sin has created a separation between he and his father. And the shame that he feels over that sin produces in him a desire to hide from God, right? To escape that judgment, to provide some kind of physical barrier between him and the one who will judge him. To hide from God's righteous gaze which is, of course, an attempt to hide from his judgment. Let me take this opportunity to say this, brethren, you cannot hide from his judgment. If you are engaging in sin and you think that God doesn't know what's going on in the most intimate of detail, right? because you, you can hide it from your husband or your wife, you can hide it from your children, you can hide it from your friends, you can hide it from your pastor, 
You can hide it from the elders of this church, from your feather brothers and sisters, but you cannot hide it from God. He knows. He sees all. And he calls to you to come out, to confess your sin, to repent of it. Now the shame that Adam experiences is great because his sin is great. Last time we discussed how exalted a view the Bible has of man, the dignity that it bestows upon him, that man's not a slave, it was created for the demigods as a, as a pet, as someone to boss around, but rather that he is a king, that he was designed to rule the earth, to be a high priest of the God Most High, which makes his disobedience all the more shameful. As we said last time, there's nothing more pathetic, more prodigal than the prince who has traded his birthright for a pauper's inheritance. And Adam now feels this shame. And no covering that he makes will be sufficient to protect him from it. There is nowhere for him to hide from God's condemning judgment. Even if he were to flee to the center of the earth, there would not be enough darkness to veil his sin from the eyes of the Lord. Which means that only God can cover such shame, such nakedness, only God. And he will do so by placing upon Adam the robe of righteousness, the prince's robe that the father of the prodigal placed upon his son following his return. A garment that in time, Adam, I believe, would have earned legitimately as he matured and grew into his role of vice regent. In other words, I don't think that nakedness was to be man's permanent state. I think we were designed to be clothed. I mean, God himself as scholars point out, is robed in a glory cloud wherever he appears in the Bible. And so man, as the image bearer of the Almighty, would also have worn garments of glory. Glory, excuse me, clothing that would reflect the majesty of God and be fitting for man's office as ruling priest. Which is to say that he would wear clothing not to hide himself, but to reveal his true nature. And so I think that we will have clothing in the new heavens and the new earth, clothing, clothing that's fitting. Another uh, hint towards this is Adam later in scripture is figuratively described as wearing the priestly garb. I think that that was the original plan. But Adam, of course, as we said, grasped for this office just as the prodigal did, by the way, right? I want my inheritance now, he says. He grasped for it, and therefore he forfeited his birthright. And so God is forced to create a temporary version of this priestly outfit out of animal skins, which is a sacrifice that, of course, points forward to the Lamb of God who will be slain in order to prepare man's robe of righteousness in the future. 